Okay, I think we can start, right? So this session will be about uh, choosing the right tool about automated testing. So if you're going to some other topic, then that's the wrong room. And uh, yeah, there are still a couple of moments uh, to, to change places. Uh, so all the slides from this session uh, will be including speaker notes, uh, are available at Google Slides, and here's a short link, uh, bit.ly slash ddd24-tests. And for those who prefer QR code, there is QR code, which leads to the same address exactly. So, before we start uh, with the test themselves, a couple of words about myself. My name is Val. Uh, I am known on all places in social media, Drupal.org, uh, Drupal Slack, Twitter, Telegram, whatever, as Val the Bold. I work uh, for the company uh, named DropSolid, which is one of the sponsors, including hosting sponsor of uh, this conference, and I'm happy to work at that for that company. Uh, at this session, we'll talk about uh, why at all we should care about automated testing, why do we care about quality of our products, uh, what affects the quality of the, of, of, uh, the product that we produce, some explanation what we should do before writing tests, uh, what are the test types, uh, how we can, okay, this is a developer conference, but still we live in the real world, so we need sometimes convince uh, the product owner or the client to invest money for, uh, into writing tests. Yes, because uh, if there is some limited uh, budget for the project, then tests usually, even if they are budgeted, they are cut at the first place, at least in my practice. So what we can do about that? And maybe in the end, if we have time uh, for questions and answers. So why, why at all we should care about writing automated tests? Uh, so. I think there's no need to explain what, what is automated test, right? This is a set of uh, checks that we perform on a certain basis. It may be every day, every week, or every release that check uh, that things are working correctly as they should. So for me, uh, one reason to, to have automated tests uh, for, for the product that I produce is pride. Okay, that maybe that's one of the uh, scenes, but still, I, I'm willing to, to be proud of the work that I'm producing. So my reputation is basically the main product that I sell on the job market. So uh, I'm trying to build the reputation during my career. Uh, this quality and uh, that adds up to my reputation is, of course, has some cost. So. It need, you need to write automated tests, and every, that's, that's a work. That's a work that you need to spend some time uh, adding tests, writing tests, uh, uh, adjusting tests to the changing functionality to the new features, maybe to some other stuff. Uh, but the good thing when it comes to convincing your boss, your client, uh, is that good quality comes at cost, but poor quality also comes at cost. Uh, and it's actually possible to measure uh, what is the cost of having automated tests versus uh, cost of not having automated tests. So there are certain KPIs how we can measure that uh, automated tests are economically viable, that they are actually more, uh, it actually makes more sense to have automated tests in the project versus not having uh, automated tests. And it all accumulates with the time. So the longer the project that you're working on uh, exists, the higher is the chance that having automated tests actually reduces the cost of having this project and maintaining it. So several uh, KPIs that we have uh, for, for having automated tests in the system is, uh, the main one is mean time to failure. So when was the last critical issue discovered in the system? Uh, and how existence of automated tests would have affected this uh, last critical issue. Uh, next KPI is uh, defect density. So what is the number of bugs uh, found per line of code or per, I don't know, per uh, 1,000 lines of code? 
And uh, another important uh, KPI is uh, customer complaints. Uh, so the abbreviation here is uh, PUM, so problems per user month. That's the name of the KPI. Uh, how exactly we test the testing, how we test the efficiency of having automated tests. So we, the testing of efficiency can be phase-based. Uh, so during code review, so we have automated tests, manual testing, and how the results are compared one to another, uh, and how things uh, behave in different uh, environments. So how it happens in acceptance, and then how it happens in production. Uh, and the final, the last but not least uh, important KPI for, for the effectiveness of having automated tests is uh, it's, it's fixed response time. So if we have automated tests, how does it affect the fixed time, the response time for discovering a new bug in a production website? Uh, it's all happening even b before we write the first uh, line of tests, right? So we even uh, haven't spoken about uh, what tests we are going to write. But still, these are things that are important to understand in order to decide what type of testing do you, do you need, what uh, technology you, you, you would, like, you would uh, need to choose. So before having any type of automated tests, uh, you, you, you can do something to improve the quality of your code. And an important technique in improving your code as a developer is a static analysis, which is uh, partially already uh, performed by the modern IDEs, like uh, PHP Storm. Um, you can have also external tools. So we have internal tools as part of PHP Storm or uh, Visual Studio. Uh, if, by the way, who here is using PHP Storm as their main tool? Okay, quite a lot of people. And Visual Studio? And any other tool? Okay, cool. So only mainly PHP Storm and uh, Visual Studio. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, Okay, so since uh, PHP Storm is uh, the the more uh, the more widely used tool uh, for for static and for development and uh, for performing static analysis as well, so setting up PHP Storm for performing uh, static code analysis is quite easy. You just go to settings, you go to PHP slash quality tools, and then you search for uh, PHP MD. PHP MD stands for PHP Mess Detector, and for PHP Code Sniffer. I, on purpose, include uh, code sniffer, which is a code standards compliance of your code, into the category of uh, static analysis that affects the quality of your code, because these things are really related. Uh, even things like searching for certain patterns in code, if, if your code is formatted the same way for all of your code, it will be much easier to find like, the, the wrong patterns of the code or to replace uh, repeating, uh, let's say, variable names if you don't use automatic refactoring or things like that. So with, uh, with the properly formatted code, it's much easier. Uh, the purpose of uh, PHP mass detector is something different. It basically uh, measures how complex is your code and uh, raises warnings if the code is too complex. Uh, for the simple reason, the more complex is the code, the, the higher is the chance that there are bugs in it. Uh, there is quite old uh, session uh, by Cyril, made, uh, I don't remember, five or seven years ago. Uh, the session name is Your Code Stinks. And if you haven't, I really recommend this session. You can search it in YouTube. It's publicly available. This, is, uh, it, this session is devoted to how the, the complexity of your code and how certain patterns that can be detected with static code analysis can affect the quality of your code and can affect uh, the bottom line, the number of bugs that uh, will, will be born in your code. So, yeah, that's the setting of uh, 
which PMD. So we are somewhere in the middle of the session, so maybe it's time to talk about the tests themselves. Uh, so what are the types of tests that we can have uh, in, in our code base? Uh, so there is some computer science behind all these definitions, but basically we have unit tests which are quite low level. They uh, test behavior of uh, certain functions or methods of classes, okay? Integration tests is uh, testing how different uh, components of the system interact one to the other. Functional tests uh, basically uh, check how business requirement of, of your client um, are fulfilled by your code base. Then there is a performance code base, uh, which are non-functional tests on how the system behaves under heavy load. And uh, again, there is no certain uh, order of significance. They're just different types of tests, that's it. And finally, there is a smoke test, which are qu quick tests that uh, are usually performed at a, after a new release or things like that. So how is, if the, the basic functionality of your system is, uh, is preserved by the latest change that you have done. So before going into details of uh, into testing, let's understand what we are testing, right? It is what we are working with. We are all uh, web developers, right? So in its basic form, web application exists in the following contexts. We have a user agent, which is browser, mobile application, uh, I don't know, uh, CLI tool, something else. So it sends requests to web server uh, for a specific resource. A web server either serves requests directly from static files or cacheable pages, uh, etc., or bypasses requests to the application. Then application uses some internal logic to build a response which then travels back to user agent through web server. That's very basic form, right? Uh, well, if you have any non-trivial application, then probably they use some kind of database to store data, and uh, which, when it takes significant resource to build response or it's a certain part on every request, it makes sense that application caches responses, or parts of it. Uh, if we are talking about solutions like BigPipe or dynamic page cache or external caches, uh, server side includes and so on. So it be also becomes more and more common that application application uses external resources. So real picture can be more complex. You can add CDN, you load load balancers, you load third party systems, and so it can. This one is by far not the the, the most complex one that you may experience in your life. That brings us to a really simple question. What exactly do you want to test? Uh, the, the answer is you, you basically test uh, the field of your responsibility. And here it, it really depends on what you're responsible for. Are you responsible for the load balancer? Probably not. If you're responsible for the web server, probably not as well because you have uh, an infrastructure team uh, cloud provider, basically someone who takes care that everything functions properly. Then you have web application, and then you have external connections, like, I don't know, uh, SAP, uh, search servers, web services, external, other, other types of external services, so on, so on. So for us, as web developers, our responsibility is the web application. So it's the the code which is uh, executed by PHP in our case. That makes sense that we test our part, which is application. So what is your project? And I assume uh, most of you use Drupal for, for the work. And uh, I have just uh, taken one of the, actually several um, client projects that I was working on. And that's the typical distribution of uh, the code base that we have, okay? So 40% of all the code that we have is NPA models, which are not PHP at all, right? About, uh, what well, slightly more than 30% is a vendor folder, which is also doesn't belong to us, and uh, hopefully it has a test of its own. The same goes, with, uh, the same goes for core, which is 
quite uh, well covered by uh, unit testing. Then we have some country models, we have some libraries, and then we have a custom theme which counts for 1.6% of the whole code base. And you cannot see here custom models because it's even lower. And the reason that you have 1.6% of uh, custom theme is because you have media there. You have heavy images, you have uh, yeah, basically images, CSS, templates, and so on and so on. What is this based on file size or number, number of files? Uh, size of files. Size, size. Yeah. Sorry? Ah, yeah, the, the question was, uh, it, it's based, uh, uh, whether it's based on number of files or the size of files, the, it's based on the size of files. And uh, since you have, uh, you may have quite uh, big uh, files in the custom theme. That leads to that custom theme weights more than the uh, custom models, which obviously can change from the project to project. There are projects with quite heavy uh, custom models base. But still, this is more or less the picture that you may have a single percent of your custom code, and the rest you take for someone else. Um, so, yes, combined with data that is specific for the project, custom code, theme, and configuration uh, counts for approximately 2% of the project size, talking about uh, weight. Uh, what's important for us and what's important, what's most, most importantly, what's more important for the client, the client doesn't care what part of the project is written by you. So what's important for the client is that your custom code behaves well. It integrates with uh, other parts of the system. Your custom theme displays everything well. It works uh, uh, both. Uh, it works equally fine on desktop and mobile. Uh, so, by this simple chart, you can see that integration checks are much more important than correct functioning of each subsystem. Well, I assume that we are not talking here about uh, core development or uh, maintaining your country models, which is a different use case. We will talk slightly about that as well. Uh, so it all comes down, it, it all means that for, uh, for people who maintain client uh, code base, the most important Part, uh, the most important type of testing is functional testing. So how well business requirements set by the client are matched by the actual behavior of your website. So let's talk about uh, what uh, tools do we have for functional testing. Maybe this exact list is uh, slightly outdated uh, and uh, there are more uh, JavaScript based uh, tools f uh, today. So PHP, uh, there's PHP unit, Nightwatch, uh, Behat, and Selenium. And uh, Selenium is different, slightly different in that line because it's not a testing tool by itself. It's uh, more of a tool to, to, to control uh, a browser, but still. Uh, and I'm sure that you uh, can name some other uh, functional testing tools uh, for, okay, let's see what our client cares about. The client cares about uh, overall performance, end user experience, site builder experience. So nothing in this list implies any knowledge about application structure, no matter what issue tracking software we use, Jira, Redmine, GitHub, GitLab. So issue is an atom of client requirements. And uh, let's just see uh, how, what, what could these client requirements could be. So what type of issue the client could, uh, oops. No, sorry, that was a little bit early. So my uh, idea here was that uh, issue uh, is an item, item of uh, client requirements. It may be issue can be a bug, issue can be a new feature, uh, and, and, and so on. And in my perspective, 
uh, BHEAD is uh, the tool that answers quite well to, to this uh, structure, to this uh, structure of having atoms of uh, requirements for coming from client. And uh, the good practice that I saw in uh, several companies is that in the uh, issue tracking tool of uh, client's choice, again, it doesn't matter with what uh, issue tracking software is that. It can be configured the same way in Jira or in Redmine. Uh, in addition to uh, describing what's actually issue is about, the client uh, tries to express the, the issue in, in, in Gherkin type uh, way. And I will talk about Gherkin a little bit later. So to build this relationship between a uh, client issue and how we testing that the issue is matched, that the issue was fixed or the new feature was implemented, I will talk about BHEAD scenarios and BHEAD features. So BHEAD features are items of testing uh, in BHEAD and they are written in a language called Gherkin. Uh, this language is really close to natural English. You will see it uh, a little bit later. The actions itself, so the actual lines of uh, Gherkin code are methods in PHP classes. So it's, uh, if you know PHP, and if you work uh, with Drupal, so you should know PHP. And uh, what's uh, good for having BHEAD as a function tool specifically for uh, Drupal is that it has uh, a wide range of ready reusable snippets that work with Drupal and that are specific to Drupal. They have a lot of uh, ready reusable snippets in general for interacting with the web page. Uh, but also there is a Drupal extension that adds actions specific to Drupal. So, let's see uh, a real life scenario. And uh, we have a requirement by the client. So that we have a client issue, uh, which also will end up as a smoke test. So something that should never ever have regressions in, in life. So what it can be? One smoke test can be that in no case, anonymous user should have access to administrative pages on Drupal. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an idea formulated by the user. As a site editor, I can use administration pages. As an anonymous user or user without site editing permissions, I get access denied when attempting to enter administrative pages. Okay. And in any tool, the test scenario would be, I either log in or stay anonymous. Then I go to slash admin as anonymous user. No, okay, just, sorry, that is written that it's anonymous user. So I go to slash admin as anonymous user. I check that application return success denied. Then I log in as site editor and I check that application returns administration page. Quite easy, right? Quite easy, but quite important. So under any, under no circumstance, this test must not fail. Uh, that's actually real code, if you can code this code, written in Gherkin. Uh, so first you have this, uh, it's called tag, JavaScript, and I'll explain it a little bit later. And then what is the feature? The feature is check that the administrator has access to the content list, okay? Since this and then goes the scenario. Given that I'm a user with administrator role and I visit page slash admin slash content, then I should see next page link. That's the test. And I will tell you that's the real Gherkin scenario. That's the real, real Gherkin feature. This is what uh, developers or in some cases even the client writes. 
The second feature which accomplishes the sanity check, the smoke uh, check, is that anonymous user does not have access to administrative pages. So given that I'm a user with anonymous role and I visit page slash admin slash content, then I should see access denied. So this is Gherkin syntax. How it actually is built. So every line is an expression, right? And so it starts with uh, things like given, and, and then, that have different meanings in terms of uh, the purpose of the test. But for the testing itself, it doesn't matter which one of the, which verb, which, what type of uh, speech is that? I'm quite confused, it doesn't matter. Then there is uh, an expression which should be converted by bhat into the call of specific PHP method, uh, PHP method. Meaning that, and I visit page slash admin slash content. That based most, most probably means that there is a method in one of the PHP classes that is called I visit page and it has parameter named uh, path or whatever you name it. Uh, and this parameter in our case is slash admin slash content. Slash content. This is how Bhat works. So it converts Gherkin expressions into calls of uh, PHP methods, and it evaluates the, the result. Uh, another type of uh, client issue that will result in uh, having a BHAT feature is uh, they want to uh, to have a VisiBig editor on uh, in the content when editing the content, right? Quite uh, natural these days. So that's the feature. That's why that's what uh, the client writes in the client in the issue tracking software as a site editor or site administrator. I want to be able to use VisiBig editor for body field of any new node. And then I should be able to switch VisiBig uh, on and off. So let's say we have uh, added this feature and it runs, every, it, it runs uh, after every release or before, actually, before deploying the release into production. Uh, we run the, the full set of tests, and one day uh, this test failed. So immediately there is another issue open for investigation why this test fails. Developer performs an investigation and finds out that the problem is caused by the version of jQuery. Okay, so during the upgrade, there is a new version of jQuery, and uh, uh, yeah, its version has uh, ha has changed. Then the news are loaded with with AJAX and uh, wow, sorry, this is the the the, the wrong. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, ignore what I just said. So the, the feature for uh, this requirement is, again, like this. This is not uh, specific to, to BHAT. So login as, uh, log as site editor, go to slash node slash add slash page, and check that the page contains a WYSIWYG editor. Uh, so how do we convert that to Gherkin language? We again write something like this. Given I'm a site editor, and I visit page slash node slash add slash page, then I should see uh, source, right? And the source, if we have a source button, then probably we, we should assume that that is the way to switch from WYSIWYG uh, mode into the source mode. Yes, that's the... Uh, the Kerkin feature for that specific uh, requirement from the client. Now, 
Another type of issue coming from the client can be a bug, okay? So the client opens a bug after the next release that the news page is empty and we do not perform a smoke test on that. Uh, so we start an investigation. So there was no change in jQuery, but news uh, stopped working. Uh, and it turns out that another developer has modified web service that exposes news to, to match the future launch of mobile application or some other purpose. And since the news page takes news from the same service, Ajax feed now returns rows of different structure. And they are, different, uh, they are not uh, rendered properly uh, on a desktop or on a mobile phone for the, for the website. So we add uh, a smoke test. With this uh, simple scenario, go to slash news as anonymous user, then check that there are news. And uh, that's a very simple scenario that we, uh, that we the very simple uh, behead feature that uh, checks exactly this thing. So given that I'm an anonymous user and I visit page slash news, then I should see show more news button. You may already notice that some expressions in Behat features repeat themselves. And that actually means that the, they call the same PHP methods in, uh, in Behat. <coughs> and there are some slides that are missing here, namely about uh, what, how this is, uh, the compilation actually happens. Um, so Behat works with the uh, concept called uh, feature context. And every feature context used by Behat uh, is a PHP class. This PHP class may inherit from other PHP classes, specifically ba uh, built for Drupal or uh, of uh, other speci specification. For example, there is a Drush context that adds different actions that work with Drush. So uh, what, uh, and I'm really sorry, I will add this to the slides after the session, but for that I will just, you just have to believe uh, to my word. Uh, so there is one single configuration for uh, Behat, how Behat behaves. Uh, it's uh, Behat uh, YAML, so it's, uh, it uses the standard YAML format. And there you define uh, different things. You define uh, what feature contexts are used. You can use third-party feature contexts, like Drush context. There is also Mink context. And uh, for those uh, who don't know, Mink is a PHP library uh, for interacting with uh, browsers. Okay? It can be uh, fake browsers or real browsers. So in order to uh, interact uh, with real browsers, you need to also launch the browser itself. Uh, nowadays, uh, both Chrome and Firefox can be launched in headless mode, so can, you can uh, control them directly. Or you can use intermediary layer like Selenium for control those browsers. And then you uh, probably need some layer that uh, allows uh, feature context to interact with, the, with Selenium. Uh, maybe, if I have some time, um, I can show you real time, a uh, real life example of feature context. Understand we have uh, 15 minutes, right? Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I have a little bit of time. Can you see this code? Yes, so that's the real example from a uh, feature context uh, class. So this method called I push the button gets one parameter called button. Uh, 
then there is a annotation that uh, defines what is the step. So what's important is uh, the part was given. I push the uh, button, the button button, and B hat translates that, that there is an action. I push the something button, and the place with the column button should be translated into parameter and passed to uh, to the class. It's as simple as that. And all um, that third parties do, they add a whole bunch of preset actions to be had so that you can choose from a uh, huge variety of uh, preset actions. Obviously, you can add the actions of yourself that are specific for the client or maybe specific for the company that repeats from one client project to another and so and so on. Yes. Okay, so let's see, we have uh, seen two simple features raised by the client. First one was a new feature, like having a WYSIWYG editor. The second uh, issue raised by the client was uh, that the news was not working. And we have created uh, two BHAT features for these issues. So let's see what are the positive and negative uh, outcomes from this experience. So first, we, we see that there is an issue and we see it immediately. After we have a BHAT in the system, uh, these two features in the system, we uh, can be more or less sure that this specific disaster will not happen anymore. If there is any change that affects the, the uh, appearance of news that the structure change uh, or some other change, we see it immediately. So we can prevent uh, new uh, failures of this kind uh, uh, in the future. Uh, as a minus, as a negative side, it took us some time to find the source of the problem. Uh, because the relation between the news page and the news web service was not obvious. And that comes from the fact that from a BHAT perspective, a uh, website is, is a black box. So it doesn't know uh, that, you, yeah, that your website is built in Drupal or in PHP at all. It can work with anything. It can test anything. So it, you have uh, Drush uh, and Drupal uh, feature contexts to have commands that are specific to Drupal. But in the same way, you can, uh, you can write a BHAT feature that will test any other website, not necessarily written in PHP. That's both a good thing and a bad thing, but this is something that you need to know, that BHAT um, interacts with a, a tested website in a black box mode. Uh -huh. Actually, I have some code. I didn't know that, so I place it just here. So, how things work? We have a feature context class or several classes, and then we have BHAT YAML that controls them all. And uh, this is the feature context that I have described earlier. It turns out that I do have it in the slides. Uh, so we have this class, and it defines every uh, action as a separate uh, method. Then it's, uh, other than that, it's a simple uh, or not simple, but it's plain uh, PHP method of, uh, of a class that is declared as a, PHP, as a feature context cl uh, class, and that's it. So this, this is how BHAT works. Uh, then uh, who writes the test? It's, it's a big question, and it depends on the project, and sometimes uh, it's written uh, by, the, by you, by the agency, by freelancers. But in many cases, and these cases are actually more uh, fruitful and more effective, is uh, when you have someone in the client team who understands the Gherkin syntax and can formulate Gherkin or Gherkin light like uh, <coughs> requirements. This helps a lot because this reduces the, the time between the, the actual uh, formulation of uh, the issue by the client to uh, its uh, implementation. 
so that was it. This is the short uh, link uh, to the slide, including all the codes and other stuff. And if you have questions, please welcome. Yep. Where is the second microphone? Uh, it's above. I'll get it. Oh, maybe I will give mine. No, 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 don't, don't worry. Needs to be turned. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay, I will give mine. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask: um, Is this like the the flow you always do? Like when a bug is found, and you always write a test afterwards to make sure it doesn't happen again, or is this for specific clients that just want everything? Because I think that Ale, uh, just how do you make that case to the client? Because it's something we struggle with as well. It's always like you said, budget and. It's more like no and then yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So when you decide, how do you decide whether to add test or not? Uh, so uh, it really depends on the, on the bug itself. One way to tackle this is to have uh, a tag in issue tracking software, whether or not this should be covered by the test. So the, when the client opens an issue, it can tag it at needs tests. Okay, and that means that the part of the acceptance criteria would be that there is a BHAT feature uh, that covers this uh, uh, issue and uh, checks that it won't happen again. Or in some other way, but having tags in uh, issue tracking is quite common. That's good. Nope. Yep. So thank you.